This afternoon, we're joined by Dave Lissy, who is the CEO of Bright Horizons Family Solutions, which is the world's leading provider of employee-sponsored childcare and work-life solutions. Dave, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. It's good to be here, Stu. I'd like to start with just a, a quick introduction from you as to what your company's about and what you do on a daily basis as a CEO. What's, what's your current role and responsibilities? Well, great. Uh, at Bright Horizons, um, our business is to partner with leading employers of all kinds to develop on-site or worksite child care centers and offer solutions that help their employees better integrate the challenges of work and life. And we do that across 43 states here in the U.S., um, also in the U.K., Ireland, Canada, and on the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, so in my role as CEO leading the company, we employ about 18,000 people um, across those four countries. And uh, we've tried over the years to uh, position ourselves as the leader in our field, uh, one that has a reputation for quality and a culture that is the employer of choice for people in our field to want to pursue a career. So, you know, I spend my time um, doing a variety of things um, that include traveling to, you know, visit our clients and, and see our employees who are located, as I said, throughout the world now. Um, as well as you know any number of you know functional tasks that might take up my time when I'm when I'm in our home home office up in Boston. You've been in your role for five years. It'll be seven years in November. Okay. Right. Let's start with looking forward. As, yeah. you, as you look to the future of Bright Horizons Family Solutions and um, the environment that it, it, you're, you're currently facing, what do you see as the most important leadership challenges you face? Well. You know, we, we've grown up over the course of, and, I, and I've been with Bright Horizons about half of its existence. So um, the company is about 21, 22 years old, mm -hmm. and um, I joined them halfway through. Um, and so we've really grown up over the years and grown the organization, um, particularly over the course of the past 10 years, pretty considerably. So more than anything, I look at my leadership challenge as the ability to cultivate leaders as we grow, who can keep our culture alive. Um, we really, you know, we are, I mean, I, I suppose it's cliche these days to say we are our people, but we don't make anything. We're a human service um, delivery company who, who earns its reputation every day by being able to employ uh, and, and motivate and retain, you know, talented people in our centers across the world, and then people who lead them at various levels, and then people who lead others trying to grow our business um, with employers. So one of the key linchpins to our, you know, our, I, I think our success and, and our future is our ability to create what I call ambassadors of our mission people who um, can, uh, you know, for whom what we've done really resonates and they, they develop a sense of uh, loyalty and commitment to it and, and want to go ahead and inspire and lead others because, you know, what you find is when, you, when you're a smaller company, you can actually be in front of many more people on a regular basis as the leader of the company. But as you grow and expand like we have, um, the challenge really is not necessarily, yeah, sure, there's those opportunities to give those, uh, those, those speeches where you have a chance to make an impact, but really um, you're touching others through layers of others and you have to build um, you know, a strong infrastructure, a culture of leaders throughout the company. And, and so you know, I would say when I think about my own leadership challenge, it's, it's to cultivate a, uh, you know, the next generation of leaders throughout the company to take the Bright Horizons mission forward. I'd like to hear more about how you're doing that. Um, but before we get to that, uh, it, it occurs to me that what Roger Brown and Linda Mason uh, and, and did when, when they hired you was, this, was pretty much the same thing, right? It, they're the, the legendary founders of, of your company. Right. And uh, you know, they established a certain kind of value system and, and way of operating uh, in the world and in, internally that uh, clearly was very important to them. And full disclosure, by the way, I've been on the advisory board of Bright Horizons Family Solutions for about 10 years or so. so in, in good service. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate yes. that. And it's always, always a treat being with uh, your amazing company and hearing about the incredible things that you're doing. Uh, but it, it occurs to me as you're speaking about it, you're looking forward and, and you know, cultivating the next generation of leadership talent. That was clearly uh, something that, that they and the board were really keen to find the right person who was going to carry forward their legacy. So can you tell us a little about how that all unfolded and how how it came to be that the fit was was right and that, that you saw them and they saw you as the, the right person to 
as I reflect back on sort of my history, um, there's sort of you know how the connection was made and then how it, how it went from there. Mm -hmm. And I think that yeah, when I think back about the how, the how the connection was made, fairly standard process, you know, recruiter, mm -hmm. you know, whole thing. But you know, I'll never forget, you know, when I originally got the call from the recruiter, I thought, you know, this is not a fit. I had spent my past what then was 11 years in healthcare. Uh, and doing nicely and growing my career mm -hmm. and to get a call from a recruiter with something that's so unique, so niche, so seemingly niche yeah. as to what they were doing. And so, you know, really, I went to the first meeting thinking this is going to be an hour sort of cordial thing, you know, neat thing, get to know somebody neat. And it turned into like a three-hour session. Um, and I think the connection was really key, the personal connection mm -hmm. um, that I felt with Roger, who was principally recruiting for, for the role at the time. You know, I just remember thinking to myself, here's somebody who embodies, or, or who seemingly at the time anyway, because, you know, you're, you're sort of a little cynical when you don't know how sure. deep this goes, um, who embodies um, both the desire to do good uh, through a service that gives society something it, it really needs, but, but to do that in the construct of a, of a strong business that has uh, a sustainability feature to it in terms of really strong economics. And, and so, you know, there are lots of dreams and visions in the world that don't ultimately get a chance to make it because they're not fueled by, by an underlying, you know, um, business strength. Uh, you know, nonprofits get fueled by donations, but ultimately we have to survive in, in, you know, in, in business by, um, by giving return to our shareholders. And I think this had the opportunity to do both. Um, so, you know, I left that first meeting and went home and said to my wife, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really intrigued. And, you know, your, your cynical part of your brain's fighting with your idealistic part of your brain. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, if this is 80% of what I think it could be, this could be a great opportunity. And I, I, I took the leap and, and joined them, and um, they took the leap on me as well. It was mutual. And what I found was, um, you know, I spent the first six months of my time with the company sort of thinking to myself, where are they hiding all the mean people? Where, where, where are all the evil people around here? Because this is, this is unlike, it's unlike a culture that, that, that I had seen before. And I, you know, I had both been with some smaller companies and some large companies. And you, you know, usually there was bigger gaps between companies' rhetoric and the reality than what I experienced with Bright Horizons initially. And, I, and it's not to say that, that we didn't have our, they didn't have their challenges, we didn't have our challenges, because surely we did. But in terms of the, the work environment, the culture, um, the, the passion, the, the, the commitment to the mission, um, it really did square with the rhetoric. And, you know, I just felt like I had a great uh, something to offer them in terms of helping to formalize and structure the growth aspect of the company mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, to hire a team of people that were, you know, business development people that could grow and build on the strong foundation ultimately that they had. But lastly, I think, and I'll conclude by saying that, that it wasn't just Roger and Linda. I met people right. like Mary Antosio, who's our president and, and, and COO, who's sort of my partner in, mm -hmm. in, in running the, the company today, and Mary Ann and countless other people who they had found and who had, who had connected to the mission, who were talented people that added to um, the company's ability to succeed. And that's really the challenge, right? It's to, it's to continue to find people for whom you know, this mission resonates with and, and try and create a place where, where, where they feel like they can build a career and, and be energized. And um, you know, I feel like part of my role as a leader is to compete for you know, somebody's discretionary um, time. You know, the time, and the time and effort that they want to put into the company that's not the expe expected sort of job description. That's mm -hmm. sort of what we're all competing for, right, when we're looking to, you know, get loyalty and, and get engagement with employees. Right. And, um, you know, my feeling on that has always been, uh, you know, you want to kind of align people's heads, hearts, and wallets. You know, you want to have their, have that, I mean, it's easy to say, you know, this is really interesting work. Um, this is work that compensates me in a way that's mm -hmm. fair to me. And it's, a, it's something that I'm really into from the point of view of where my heart is. And, and if you can get those three things in balance, mm -hmm. um, then you really have something. And, and that's what we've tried to strive for at Bright Horizons. So as you back to the question about uh, developing leadership talent for the future and continuing to find and, and, and cultivate the kinds of people who are going to represent the mission uh, and to, to grow. Uh, the company. What are you doing to uh, to make that happen? To realize that that goal? Well, let, let me start by saying when I first took on this role, um, I was fortunate in the sense to not only have, as you acknowledged, really talented visionary people who founded the company, but 
a leader in Roger who was sort of egoless with respect to the transition of leadership, which I think, as I was looking at it at the time, people were kind of giving me advice, was pretty rare in the world, that the, that the leader who was transitioning, I had been told by many people who've gone through it, you know, would, would be founder, in the way. The founder, would be the founder, sure. right, would, would be in the way. And that wasn't the case. I think Roger tried very hard and, and still is one of my most significant advisors, mm -hmm. you know, to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think it has a lot to do with his intelligence and his, his emotional intelligence and his, and his, mm -hmm. and his um, you know, his, uh, his sort of lack of ego as it relates to any of this. But, but that said, when Marianne and I, who I, again, consider to be my partner in running the company, when we, when this whole transition was happening, we said to ourselves, Part, part of our main job, part of my main job, was to take what had been lots of sort of informal practices, largely on the backs of very visionary founders mm -hmm. who were able to win loyalty by virtue of who they were and their sort of uh, deity like their, their, their sort of their, their positioning in the world, the world of our field, mm -hmm. and create some structure to it. So we started, we embarked, I'll give you some examples. So we, we embarked right away uh, in the first year, and this has become a tradition, on what we call our annual road trip. So every year, uh, Marianne and I go out and we meet, and we'll start um, next week in Chicago with our 2008 version. We don't sell t-shirts, but we, we, uh, we do have a full road trip. There is not and a CD there's, there's no CDs, uh, you wouldn't want to hear me sing. <laughs> but um, but uh, we go out and we meet with hundreds of our managers all throughout the countries in which we operate in, you know, in town hall-like mm -hmm. forums to basically, you know, listen to them. And every year we take away a few things that are the common themes that we hear in the field. I think it accomplishes a couple things. One, I think it accomplishes a connection between, mm -hmm. between that skips sort of um, management layers and mm -hmm. gets us down to our first line managers who are really critical and allows them to have a connection to us, which we've gotten very positive feedback about. But for us, it allows us to make some tangible uh, change that is directly coming from the feedback that we're getting from our first line managers. Mm -hmm. Uh, some examples of that have been we modified our tuition assistance program to fit what the needs were in the field that we weren't getting the full flavor of by, by virtue of how information gets filtered so you and how ultimately, ultimately gets. You're out there listening and you create a culture of that. You model that. So if people see me as the CEO, Marianne as the president and COO of the company doing that, we want that happening at all levels. We know we can only get to certain numbers of people right. every year, but we want that level of, of listening we want people to not, you know, I, I want people to not get hung up on hierarchy, you know, to sort of skip levels when necessary to be sure they're getting information. I think leaders oftentimes get, you know, I find myself sometimes, the bigger we get, you know, if I don't keep multiple channels of information open, sure. I, get, I get, you know, what people want to tell me. And that's dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous for lots of leaders in, in positions of far greater influence than, than, than me. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I think that's what uh, you know what we've tried to do is create that you know create that culture of um, of listening and of um, of humble sort of nobody's nobody's too high up or too high of a title um, to listen or get involved at any at any level um, sort of a a bit of a sort of servant leadership you know kind of kind of not servant in the sense of religious or anything like that but in terms of um, you know serving our 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 clients and our families, we're all in that together, mm -hmm. and uh, we have common challenges.